Hello everyone and welcome to another Making Physics Easy webinar. So today we're going to be discussing the mechanisms of some interactions in ultrasound imaging. Uh, so as everybody knows, this series is for radiologists who are sitting their part one physics exam. So uh, while you're preparing for your physics exam using your textbooks and your MCQ books, this is intended to be a webinar series that uh, can be a companion to your revision. Uh, so the, it's going to consist of curriculum focused teaching and multiple choice questions, which are in the style of the part one exam. Uh, so before we get started with the content today, let me introduce myself. Uh, for anybody who might not have been on the call before, or anyone who's watching the recording for the first time. Uh, my name is Joanna Koshi, and I have a BSc in physics and an MSc in nanoscience. Uh, I'm part of the faculty at Revised Radiology. Uh, I created this physics course along with Dr. Koshi Jacob. It's been running for a year now. We've had a few candidates who attended the physics course and successfully passed the examination. So uh, we're yeah, very happy that you um, are watching this video and hopefully it's very useful for you. So just before I uh, start the um, content, I'd just like to remind everybody that this session is being recorded. So you can watch the uh, recording uh, on your dashboard once this is done. If you have the part one physics or the part one combined subscription. And um, if you don't want to appear on the recording, then all you have to do is keep your mic and your camera off during the call and you won't appear on the recording. Okay, let's get straight into the content for today. Uh, so to understand acoustic reflection, which is, um, as we know, in ultrasound Im imaging, uh, the process that happens is the transducer produces pulses, ultrasound pulses, which are sent into the patient's body. Then these ultrasound pulses uh, interact with objects within the patient's body, and they're reflected back in the form of echoes. And these echoes travel backward towards the trans transducer, and then they're um, detected by the transducer, and then the transducer uses the trans uh, converts them to electrical signals, and then um, uses this information to create an image of what's happening inside the patient's body. So, in in order to understand reflection, we need to understand acoustic uh, impedance. So that's the formula for acoustic impedance that I put on the screen right now. Uh, acoustic impedance is a property of individual materials and it has the symbol Z. So that's usually how we uh, denote it. And the Z of a material, the acoustic impedance of a material depends on what's happening on a small scale in the material. So it's uh, the acoustic impedance is a measure of uh, how easy it is for sound to pass through the material. And this depends on the atomic configuration. So we won't go into the details of that. Um, so the acoustic impedance of a material is the product of its density and the speed of sound C in that material. So if you look at that formula there, you'll see that Z is equal to rho, which is the density of the material multiplied by the speed of sound C in that material. So the product of these two factors gives us acoustic impedance. So it's uh, these factors that we'll be thinking of when we um, try to uh, figure out what the acoustic impedance of a material is. Why is the acoustic impedance important? Um, because it's what, because the difference in acoustic impedance at a boundary is what determines how much reflection happens at a certain boundary. Um, so trying to estimate whether a boundary will be a highly reflecting boundary or a weakly reflecting boundary depends on the difference in acoustic impedance at the boundary. So um, it's good to have a mental estimate in your head of how much the acoustic impedance of a material actually is. 
the SI unit is real. Uh, so I'd just like to ask a question uh, for those who are in the room. Uh, could you please rank the following materials in the order of their acoustic impedance and put it in the chat box? Cortical bone, bowel, gas, blood, fat. So if you could rank them from uh, lowest acoustic impedance to highest ac acoustic impedance and put it in the chat box, I'll just wait a bit for the answer to that. So when we, um, okay, I've got one answer in the chat box already. Uh, let's see if that's the right answer. Yeah, gas, fat, blood, bone. So that's depending on the density of the materials as we'll see in the following chart. Uh, you can see, if you take a look at this chart here, it's a measure of the acoustic impedance um, in a number of materials. So uh, what we see is that air has a very, oh, this is a measure of the speed of sound of a number of materials. So what we see is that air travels uh, very slowly. Uh, sound travels very slowly in air. Sound travels uh, very fast in bone because it's dense. Uh, sound travels around the same in liver, kidney, blood, all this different types of soft tissue. And sound travels a little slower in fat and water. Uh, average soft tissue, the speed of sound is 1,540 meter per second. Uh, the density of, uh, similarly, the density of cortical bone is relatively high and the density of bowel gas is relatively low. So that's why you will get a very high acoustic impedance for uh, uh, the um, bone, whereas you'll get a very low acoustic impedance for the uh, bowel gas because it's mostly air. It's based on that formula that we looked at. Uh, all right, now let's. Um, now we've learned this word called acoustic impedance. Now we'll try to fit it into the puzzle of how do these reflections happen that we measure with the ultrasound transducer. So now let's talk about boundaries. Uh, a boundary here is between two materials with different values of acoustic impedance C. So you can see that there's a medium one on the left side of the boundary and a medium two on the right side. And uh, medium one has an acoustic impedance of Z1, Z1, and medium two has an acoustic impedance of Z2. And you can see that a purple uh, ultrasound wave is being incident on the boundary. An orange ultrasound wave is transmitted through the boundary and a blue ultrasound wave is reflected back from the boundary. So we're going to discuss how these processes actually happen. At the boundary, some of the wave will be reflected and some will be transmitted. First, we'll take a look at normal incidence and normal incidence means what happens when the wave strikes at 90 degrees. Uh, just excuse me for one second. I'm just gonna get a glass of water. Uh, sorry, I forgot to keep one near me. Um, Marianne, could you just pause the recording for one second? Sure. Thank you. All right, so let's see what happens when the wave strikes at 90 degrees, uh, which is perpendicular to the boundary. Uh, the strength of the reflection is related to the change in Z value across the boundary. So what we're talking about is the difference in the two Z values. Uh, so imagine if the Z value of one is 600 rails and the Z value of another is 700 rails. Uh, what would be the change in Z value across the boundary? Could you put that in the chat box? So if the change in Z value, uh, how much would that be? If medium one had a Z1 of 600 and medium two had a Z2 of 700?
Uh, I'll just repeat the question again. So if the Z1 on in, a, in the first medium where the wave is incident is 600 and the Z2 in the second medium where the wave is passing through is 700, what would be the uh, difference in the Z2 and Z1? One hundred, yeah, that's right. So the strength of the relationship, uh, the, the strength of the reflection is related to the um, difference in the z value. So if it was two hundred, for example, we'd get a stronger reflection, or if it was one thousand, we'd get a stronger reflection still. Uh, so would you expect the the um, reflection to be stronger at the fat? gas uh, at a fat gas boundary or at a bone gas boundary um, could we answer this question in the chat box would we expect the reflection to be stronger at a fat gas boundary or at a bone gas boundary Can anybody think of the answer to that question? Uh, would we expect a stronger reflection at the boundary between gas and fat? Or would we expect a stronger reflection at the boundary between gas and bone? Gas and bone, that's right. All right. Uh, so if the difference between the Z values on either side of the boundary is large, then that interface will be a strong reflector. Uh, boundaries between materials of similar Z values will result in relatively weak reflections. So based on this, uh, would we expect a, you know, a boundary between two types of soft tissue? Would we expect a strong echo uh, or a strong reflection or would we expect a weak echo? Or rather, would it be a very bright, would it be very bright on the ultrasound image or would it be sort of grayish? Uh, boundary between two soft tissues yeah weak reflection dark that's exactly right all right so we can express the strength of the reflection using the reflection coefficient so that's uh, r is equal to z1 minus z2 the whole thing square divided by z1 plus z2 the whole thing square so what we're seeing here is that uh, the reflection coefficient depends on the square of the difference between the impedance values as well as the sum of inversely proportional to the sum of the impedance values. Uh, all right, so this is the fraction of intensity, so reflected at the boundary. Um, the fraction of the intensity that's reflected at the boundary. So imagine if you had uh, 100 intensity incident on the boundary, 100 watt per meter square, and you had 70 watt per meter square reflected at the boundary, then your uh, R would be 0 0.7 in that case. It would be 70 over 100, and it would be 0 0.7. The unit is watt per meter square. Uh, let's also, so now we're going to discuss something called specular reflection. So specular reflection, reflection occurs at large smooth boundaries, which have much larger dimensions than the wavelength of the ultrasound wave. Um, in this image, we can see the acoustic shadows behind a strong reflector. So not where the yeah, arrow marks are pointing, but you can see that there's very strong shadows. That's because there's a strong or a specular reflector there, which is uh, casting, which is reflecting a lot of the ultrasound radiation. And it's casting a shadow on the other parts of the image. So what is the optimal strength of a reflector for the purposes of imaging? 
do we want a very strong reflector for the purposes of imaging? Could you put that answer in the chat box? So would we want a very strong reflector for the purposes of imaging? And if so, why? No, because energy cannot be transmitted. That's right. All right. So uh, the ability, yeah. So it's a complicated question. Uh, if the first of all, if the interface creates a very weak echo, we won't be able to detect it via the transmitter. Uh, so the ability of the system to detect and display the existence of the interface is greater if the interface creates a strong echo, obviously. But the problem is that beyond a strong inter interface, there'll be a region of shadow in which little or no information can be obtained. So there's a trade-off here. Uh, you will either get a strong reflector where the echo will be very visible um, or that you know, the interface will be very detectable, which is a good thing. If the echo is too weak, we won't be able to detect it or to see it on the image. But the other problem is that uh, if the reflector is too strong, then most of the energy, uh, it won't be transmitted, it'll be reflected. And so it won't be able to uh, go through behind the reflector. Um, think of it as imagine you're shining a light into, in order to see into a room, but um, there's a large mirror in your way. So you want to see all the objects inside the room, but there's a mirror in front of you. The light, all you're going to see is your own reflection in the mirror, uh, or that you'll see the light reflecting off the mirror. You won't be able to see the objects behind. Whereas if you, if instead of the mirror, there was a cup in the room, the cup would reflect some of the light. You'd be able to see the cup, but the cup wouldn't reflect all the light and you'd be able to see uh, the objects behind the cup as well. So that's why that's the kind of trade-off that we have with when it comes to specular reflection. Let's quickly discuss coupling gels. So air is trapped in the small space between the transducer and the skin. So uh, does air have a high acoustic impedance or a low acoustic impedance? Low. Okay, so would the um, air skin boundary be a weak or a strong reflector? And the air transducer boundary? Strong, yeah. So that's exactly the reason why we use coupling gels because air is trapped in the small space between the transducer and the skin. So uh, because of its very low impedance value, even a tiny amount of such air will cause serious image degradation by forming a very strongly reflecting interface. So ultrasound energy will be reflected back into the transducer rather than passing into the patient. Uh, so the coupling gel serves a couple of purposes. The first is to displace the air. The other is to lubricate the surface of the skin so the transducer can move smoothly. Uh, it's important to remember that some patients are allergic to some gels and some gels will also attack the transducer surface. Um, coupling sterility is critical if there's an open wound or a biopsy is planned. And uh, the cleaning of the transducer between patients is important to minimize the cross-infection risk. So I think all that's pretty clear. There's not much physics in that. It's just some um, safety rules. So yeah, I think that's pretty clear. I don't think I need to explain that again. Um, Let's now discuss the situation in which there's non-normal impedance. So what happens when a wave approaches a boundary at an oblique angle? Uh, the reflected wave behaves exactly as a beam of light reflected from a large flat mirror. 
So you can see there in the image, there's the medium uh, Z1 on the left-hand side and then the medium Z2 on the right-hand side. The incident wave approaches the boundary. Uh, it strikes the boundary at an angle I. Now, again, some part of the uh, ray will be transmitted and some part of the ray will be reflected. What's important to remember here is that this is happening exactly as um, reflection in terms of uh, light. So what's happening is that the wave that's transmitted is transmitted at a different angle, whereas the wave that's reflected uh, is reflected at the same angle as the angle of incidence. The angles I and R known as the angles of incidence and the angles of reflection will be equal. So why would this situation be a problem in practice? Can anybody think of uh, why, you know, the if the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection, why would this situation be a problem in practice? So if uh, the rays may not reach the desired organ due to reflection. Okay, uh, that's not exactly the right answer. Um, so what happens when, I'll tell you what the, that's a good guess though, and it's slightly related. So the reflected wave would be detected by another transducer than the one that produced it. Uh, so the way that the ultrasound imaging system works is that uh, the transducer sends out an echo, uh, sends out a pulse, and then it waits for the pulse to hit whatever is in front of the transducer. And then uh, the transducer waits for the echo to come back, and then it creates an image of the, you know, whatever is in front of it. Now, this situation assumes that the just a second. Uh, this situation assumes that the uh, echoes that are coming back to the transducer are the echoes of the pulse that was sent out by that transducer. So what happens if the echoes that come to the transducer are actually echoes from another pulse that was sent out by a completely different transducer? So that's what happens when um, the incidence that takes place is non-normal incidence. Uh, there's a high chance for a reflector to create a strong reflection and go undetected um, or be seen in a completely different place. Therefore, it's good to scan a surface over a number of angles in order to prevent this from happening. So we can make sure that objects are being detected at a you know 90 degree um, angle. A small change in transducer position can create a large change in the image because the angles at which the uh, ultrasound is hitting the uh, boundary changes. Uh, could you put a yes in the chat box if this concept is clear? Why a small change in transducer position can create a large change in the image? Yes, okay, perfect. Uh, let's keep going then. Um, okay, the transmitted beam doesn't travel in the same direction as the incident beam. Uh, here, angle T is called the angle of reflection and the relationship between the two angles I and T 
is sine i by sine t is equal to c1 by c2, where c is the speed of sound in the medium z1, and c2 is the speed of sound in the medium z2. So Snell's law applies to the refraction, refraction of sound. Okay, so just for um, uh, Faye Kemi, who's just joined the webinar right now, I'll just quickly run through what we discussed. We spoke so far about uh,